Hey, what's up guys? It's Steel from Funeral Concepts. So this is me answering all the questions you may have with regards to wedding photography and my style of shooting. Anyway, let's get started. Now mind you, this is going to be quite a lengthy video. So if you want a specific topic, just look at the timestamps in the description below. Also down there is going to be my first ever online course hosted by myself. So if you are interested in becoming a YouTuber, learning more about product reviews and how to do it, then check the first link in my description below. Now, when it comes to a wedding shoot, how I prepare is basically very simple. I make sure that the day before the actual shoot, I have everything that I need with me. Now, in a situation where I have to travel outside where I live, then I make sure I pack everything before I set off. So the cameras, the memory cards, the card readers, my laptop is going to be with me. The light I'm going to use, my speed light. I make sure I have a backup of everything as well. Well, basically everything I'm going to need, I make sure I pack them the day before I travel or the day before the wedding shoot so that I'm not surprised during the actual day. Now, depending on the clients I also get during the consultation section, we pretty much discuss how the whole process is going to be like. So during the wedding shoots, they already have a fair idea of how everything is going to be like, which makes it a lot easier for me. So in the whole preparation, then during the consultation is where it actually starts. Then me bringing my gear and all of that to the wedding day is more like the latter part. I use Google Maps. Yes, I use Google Maps and Instagram a lot. So if the program is going to be in Takwa, it's going to be in Kumasi or Takwa, these are places I have already visited. So I have a fair idea of some places that I could recommend to the clients for us to take pictures at. But if it is a new place to you, you just reach out to them. If they already know of particular places that they can take pictures, just search it on Google map or let them share the link with you. Take a look at their 3D map or 360 map. It's one of them. Take a look at it, find vantage points that you can take all of your amazing pictures at. And once you do, you can take screenshots and save them down or write those particular positions down. Now, if the client can't help you out with this, just hop on Instagram, type the name of the location in there and search via people, post pictures and all of that. You are going to notice that people have already taken pictures at that location and usually they add it up at the Instagram link above. So you have a fair idea of how that place looks like and all of that. Now, at some wedding venues, they don't usually have issues with photographers taking pictures over there. Reason being, the client booked their venue for their wedding and they know that photography is going to take place, video recording is going to take place at those particular areas, so they don't really bother so much. It is when you are moving away from the space the client booked, that is where the issue comes in. So if they said they want a big space for their reception, but they are planning on taking pictures at another place, still within that vicinity and it is sort of a private property to other people then it becomes an issue so let's take this example so you decide to book a particular space for your wedding reception at a hotel now that is the space you booked for that is the space you paid for so you can take your infinite number of pictures over there and no one has issues but it becomes a problem when you want to move away from where you said you are going to take your pictures to the reception where new people are coming in to book rooms to sleep in and all of that you start taking pictures there it becomes an issue so in a situation like this some hotels would request that you pay again to use that particular space which is of no issue you, you definitely have to because you paid for a particular space and you are moving away from the space some would also not have issues with it some hotels we've been to as long as the bride and groom book for that hotel or they have a sleepover at that hotel, you can take pictures where you want and they don't have issues. Whether in the elevator or the stairs or anywhere at all at the reception, they have absolutely no issues. But if you don't secure your booking, if you don't secure a room there, they are not going to allow you to take pictures. There are some hotels like um, Longi, for example, in Takwa. Even if you don't sleep over, even if you don't have a booking, you just walk in there, 
you request that you want to take pictures there you pay some amount and you start taking your pictures there whether people are there or not they don't care so it depends on how the place is like and what particular permits or permissions you have to shoot over there have a short list of everything you want to take just have a plan for everything if you know you are going to start with a dress up have a short list in the dress up category if you are going to take pictures at the event grant you know you have to get a shot of everyone at the event grant so have a short list also in there once the items for the traditional marriage the items for the lady or the lady's family come in you also have to take pictures of that have them all in a short list have them in a breakdown if you have to write it on a sheet of paper i mean there's nothing wrong with it you can carry it around just don't lose it if you have to put it on your phone just have it on your phone but the thing is have a plan of all the short list and it makes it a lot easier for a busy wedding shoot so most of the time it's pretty simple we just jump on a phone call Ideally, I would prefer it being a Zoom call because that one you see the clients maybe for the first time or not. You see them, they see you. It builds that relationship right there and then. But if it's not possible, you can just jump on the phone call, have a conversation with them, let them know your style of shooting, let them know when you'll be arriving at the events grounds, let them know everything about your team. If you're coming with three people, if you have female part of your team, you let them know so that if they are booking a room for you, they have to book separate rooms for guys and separate rooms for girls. So you have to give all of this information right there. So most of the time it's just on the phone call. Sometimes it's through <laughs> texting. Sometimes it's through texting and all of that. But ideally you would want to jump on a video call with them. It doesn't have to be Zoom or Skype or anything like that. Even WhatsApp video call, as long as they are comfortable with it, you can jump on that and get um, all of those informations out there. Now ideally I have one wedding contract which I send to every client. But sometimes after reading them, they may or may not agree with certain things. So what I do is I make sure that those particular things that they want to take out or add in, I edit them. Basically, I tailor them to what their specific need is. So as long as both of us can agree on those terms, basically that is the aim we all go for and everyone is happy. So in a situation where I have multiple weddings to shoot, the first thing I do is first come first serve so if your date is first june of a particular year and another person comes with the exact same date if it is possible and if the second client would agree that you have another team member from the same exact team to shoot then you can accept that offer so in a situation like that you get another professional photographer to cover that second event for you and even if the person is not working in your team you can let one of your team members join so that that person can basically talk to the set photographer that we do certain things this way or probably he's can, he can be the intermediate between yourself and the new photographer who is taking those pictures for you. Now there are instances where we photographers do that. I myself have had other photographers shoot my weddings for me because I wasn't available at the time or I couldn't travel that long distance so basically after the whole thing the backup i beat them um i get those footages and i edit myself i edit myself because i have a particular style that i want to keep so i don't let them edit for me i just pay the photographers to take the pictures for me then i do all the editing by myself all other communication between the client and the photographer is going to be between me and the client, not the uh, photographer they met during their wedding day. So in a situation like that, like I mentioned, first come, first serve. There's nothing that can prepare you enough for this. Mentally, I know that it's going to be a one day event, traditional wedding, white wedding and reception all happening the exact same day. You know, you are probably going to be there around 7 a.m. in the morning and leave the premises around 8 p.m. So once you have that fair idea, you know how to schedule yourself, when to eat, when to drink and all of that. Make sure you have all your equipment charged and ready for that particular day. If you have to do it overnight, make sure you do it overnight so that the next day 
you come in with everything at full battery. And also when you're leaving for this sort of wedding shoot or wedding days, make sure you carry your chargers along. So that if the battery, if you have even five batteries and they are dying, you can also charge them up on the go. Don't leave your batteries or battery chargers at home thinking there are five batteries so you can cover the entire day with it. No, carry your chargers along with you. So these are sort of the things that I do to prepare myself. As long as I know I have backups, as long as I know that my batteries are fully charged, as long as I know that I have um, extra memory cards to work around this, and as long as I have my battery chargers with me, I know that it's going to be a long day, so I have myself physically and mentally prepared for this. When it comes to equipment you need for wedding photography, obviously the first one is going to be a professional camera, which most people are going to recommend getting a full frame camera because it's going to give you better low light shots during the receptions. Because it has a bigger sensor, you're going to get more bokeh in your background or blurry background, even if you're using the exact same lens as you use on your crop sensor cameras. I've already made a video about why everyone should get a full frame camera that is going to be up here. So you can open it up in a new tab. Once you're done watching this video, you can continue with that one. So that is that with the cameras. You also have to get your memory cards, make sure that they are fast enough to record or read and write all of the images you are going to take. You have to consider your speed light or flashes, which you are also going to use. If it's going to be an off-camera flash, you make sure that you get a trigger as well. Now in terms of lenses, your 85 millimeter should be the first one you even pick up. Mostly, if you are shooting weddings, you can go with a 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and 85 millimeter. These three can save you a lot. Some others who also want to go for the 16 to 35, the 24 to 70, and the 70 to 200 millimeter lens, which is also absolutely great. So depending on your style of photography, you can pretty much get any of these lenses and move with it. Now, like I've been saying, you should get a backup equipment for all of these. So if your 35 millimeter lens falls or is damaged during the wedding day, you can still rely on maybe the 55, sorry, the 50, yeah, or 55 or 85, millimeter lens for the rest of the day. Now, if you're also using off-camera flashes, you have to make sure that you have your light stance also with you. Because if you don't have it, then you probably have to get an assistant to hold the light for you. So basically, these are all of the actual things you have to carry around. Most people depend on flashes a lot, but I personally, I also add in a continuous light. The continuous light helps me in darker situations where my camera is unable to focus because it can't see the subject. So that is where I introduce my continuous light and that lights up my subject so that the camera can see and I can take the picture using the flash. So some people, I, I've been following a lot of people on social media. Some people just use continuous lighting for their entire photography. They don't even rely on speed lights or flashes. So depending on your style, again, depending on your style, you decide what you actually need for your style of photography. But the bottom line is all of this stuff should be included in your photography gear. So basically what I do is I carry along every light that I think I would need. So I'm not dependent on whoever is going to be there slides to use. An example would be you are not dependent on the light from the decorators during the wedding reception. No, I carry my own continuous light. If you can have one, if you can have two, carry both of them, send it to the reception so that if their lighting is not so good, you can just introduce yours and get your photos. The client is not going to tell you that uh, because the lighting was poor, they forgive you for taking bad pictures. No, you have your job to do and your job is to capture as beautiful, and as many pictures as possible. So as long as the client is satisfied with it, they don't care what light you use. So what I do is I just send every single light that I think I'm going to need. I send it there myself. I don't rely on what light other people are going to bring me. So you notice sometimes you walk into a room, the makeup artist has her light on and I'll still bring my light. If I can share hers at that particular point, I would use them. But if for some reason she has to also go and do the makeup of another bride or she has to leave, I'm not left out because I have my light to work with. So she can go and I can continue with my work. Now, there isn't a right or wrong answer to this particular question. 
but this is what I do. When I am outdoors shooting just the couple, I usually have my lens open wide. So if I'm shooting with an f1.8 lens, usually it's going to be between f1.8 and f2.5. That is where my sweet spot is going to be for me. And that is going to give me a lot of blurry backgrounds in my shots. And also when I'm outdoors, I would like to shoot at an ISO which is much lower, like ISO 100 and sometimes even 50 if your camera supports that. That is what I would like to go for so that I don't get a lot of grainage in my shots. But when you enter the room, you know you can't always shoot at ISO 100 inside the room. So you have to crank it up to around 400 and 800, depending on the light that you are using. And also in situations where you are capturing pictures of the bride with her bridesmaid, you want to get everyone in focus because there are more people right now in the shot. So in those shots, I may increase my ISO and close up my aperture. So I'll be shooting around um, aperture 2.5 to 3.5 and sometimes even 4. That is going to be the range that I'm going to be shooting in because there are more people here and I want to capture all of them as much as possible. So if you are talking about essential camera settings, it depends on what you are shooting at that particular moment and the one that best fits that need. So like I've already mentioned, I already carry the light that I think I'm going to be needing for the wedding shoot. But in a situation where we are out in the sun and the sun is so scorchy, then we try to find shade. So we hide behind a building where it is casting a shadow onto another side of the building. The other side of the building where the shadow is, that is where we are going to find the beautiful spots to take those pictures. If you don't get something like that, particularly you are on a park or you are out in the open and there are no trees around to you know, cast a shadow onto your couple, then you can go with your diffusers. So Typically, you have to get an assistant for this or someone to help you out with this. You open up your diffuser, you get the white part out, then you hover them over the couple, then you take your shot. Other people call it the reflector. So <laughs> your reflector, you take the diffuser out and you do that. Now, the unfortunate thing with this is because Depending on the reflector you are using, but even if you are using the biggest reflector, you can't take wide shots because those holding the reflectors are going to show in in the shot. So this is where your 85 millimeter or higher is going to give you much better results because you are going to get much closer shots. Right around the waist up, shots are going to be quite okay but trying to get a full shot with other people in there is not going to be ideal but in a situation where it is an indoor lighting if the light there is not working for me i introduce my own lights the ones that i brought and i use them and i don't really have any issues with that now i've mentioned this already get backup equipment for everything that you have the idea is to get backup equipment for everything but sometimes the money is not available, so what do we do? Then invest in a gear that is going to last a longer time. Don't purchase a second-hand device, which even when you are doing birthday shoots with it, sometimes the shutter gets stuck when it opens, or sometimes the mirror will be stuck at the top if you are using a DSLR. If you know of these sort of issues, get a backup camera so that when it kicks in, you just switch to your backup camera and start using them. You don't necessarily have to buy the exact same camera as your main camera. So an example, if you are using the Nikon Z7 Mark II or the Canon R6, your backup camera doesn't necessarily have to also be an R6. It can be the Canon RP or the Canon M50 or even a Canon 600D, something that can also take pictures. You'll be surprised that if at some point your camera is not showing or is malfunctioning because of droplets or rain or maybe a technical glitch, you can switch to this inexpensive camera and use it to take your pictures. So the idea here is get backup equipment of almost everything that you have. If it is a speed light, get a second speed light. If it is a camera, get a second camera get extra memory cards, get extra batteries. So I use two editing softwares for my photos. The first one is going to be Adobe Lightroom Classic. What it does is you just dump all of your images on there and you can edit all of them in one sequential order. <laughs> so 
it's a bulk editing software. So all your images, if you have 10,000 pictures, you can just put all of them in one catalog, just edit them as you go. The second one will be Adobe Photoshop. So I'll pick certain images that I feel these images are bangers. I would want to post them on my Instagram or something like that. Those are the images I'm going to export or import in Photoshop and do my retouching over there. So removing the bad parts of the makeup, removing pimples. If there's anything wrong with the body or they are not comfortable with, that is where you do your adjustments, then you upload from there. So two editing softwares, Adobe Lightroom Classic and Adobe Photoshop. So this is how I take care of my backup of photos for my clients. I have a couple of hard disks lying around. So after every wedding, I back up onto three different hard disks. There's one hard drive which is sitting at home, going absolutely nowhere. There are two that I carry along with me every time we have a wedding to shoot. So let's call them A and B. On A, I'm going to back up all the files onto it and B, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to give the drive B to my second shooter or the second photographer. He is probably not living near me. Most of the time he's not living near me. So he will take that hard disk to his house and keep it safe until our next wedding. I'll take the drive A, also keep it to myself. So what I do is the hard disk sitting at home, I back up, I unplug it, I just hide it somewhere. Then the other one that I have, the drive A is going to be in the computer. That is where I'm going to work off of. Now I also upload all of the photos onto Google Drive, but most of the time it is when I am done with editing everything. That is when I upload onto my Google Drive. So I have a backup of, those particular images that we are going to take or those particular images that we took of the client on three different hard disks, two with me and one with another photographer away from me and one also on the cloud, so four different backups. Now I should say it's probably going to be six different backups because apart from these four, my camera also shoots with dual SD cards. So what I do is both SD cards will be running at the same time when I'm taking pictures so at any point in time when we are done with the event, I back up all of these files. I do not format the, um, the SD card. I do not format those SD cards. I still have them in until I'm done with editing all of these images. If you're a photographer here, you know you can just use a single day to edit all of your images. You can also use about three days or one week to edit all of your images, but sometimes we slack around, sometimes we become a bit lazy, so we don't. And before you shout at me that this is going to make you have multiple SD cards, it's costly and all of that, there's absolutely no issues with it. I understand you perfectly. I'm not saying go and buy 128 gigs of storage on your SD card for about 10 different SD cards. No, you can get 10, 32 gigs of storage SD cards and just work with all of them or some of them at the same time. Now, there are so many different styles of wedding photography. Some people like to shoot dark and moody. Other people like bright and airy. Other people like graded and toned. Other people prefer shooting in black and white or vintage and all of that. So there are a whole lot of other styles of photography. Depending on where you come from and your style, you can incorporate other people's styles in yours as well. Just make sure that you have something that goes well with you, something you are comfortable with doing. Now, in most situations, when it comes to the groom, there isn't much of a problem because I'm a guy, he's a guy, and we just talk it out. So most uh, guys are comfortable with their friends around. They are comfortable talking to a man one-on-one. -on -one. They are comfortable with posing in certain directions because they feel it is a guy they are talking to and they don't have to get so nervous in front of the camera. It is with the ladies that you have to pay so much attention to them. Now over at this part, I would like to crack jokes a lot. Jokes that is going to make her smile as much as possible, but you also have to be careful. Some jokes are quite expensive, so if you notice that you are the only one laughing at your jokes, it's probably not a good joke. 
wow, the way your cheeks are so big, if your husband was here, he's going to start pressing them. Something like this is most likely going to get her to laugh at it, or even the bridesmaids or something like that to laugh at the joke. That is where you create this atmosphere of comfortability around you. So they see you, they know you're a photographer, but you are cracking jokes, you're making them smile, you're making them laugh. You talk to them about something like, imagine your husband is here, what would you be doing and all of that. Anything to make them feel comfortable, that is what I do. And I also have to dress properly, make sure you are smelling good, make sure your personal hygiene is on point. So that when you walk into the room, I mean, people don't get uncomfortable around you. Don't go with a straight face, with an angry look and all of that. Smile a lot. I mean, you are doing your job and your job is working with people. So as long as you are getting good feedback from them, you are going to be nailing so many jobs right after that. So again, with me, I tend to crack jokes a lot. Jokes that are not expensive, jokes that everyone can relate to. It, sometimes it happens to me, sometimes it is right around the room. Some Anything that is going to make the bride smile on her wedding day, I tend to do it and that helps me a lot. I wouldn't say this is my best approach, I would say this is the simplest approach anything to make the couple feel comfortable with themselves. So let them have a conversation, let them be touchy, hugging, maybe have the groom talking to the bride right around the ear or nibbling on the ear, tickling the bride and all of that. Anything that usually when they are alone in the room, they would want to feel comfortable doing. Now you'd be surprised that when they start getting comfortable around the camera, they are even going to give you the amazing poses that you want. But I also have a couple of poses that usually I do, and this is my go-to poses all the time. So one of them being looking face to face, locking foreheads, or probably locking their lips. Another would be one person standing behind the other. So probably the groom standing behind the bride and hugging her from behind, or the bride doing the exact same thing. Other styles would be both of them holding hands and walking towards my camera. This is where you have to increase your shutter speed and start taking those pictures as fast as possible. But there are some other times you have specific poses that you have to do. So you just get a short list either on your phone or on your camera or you just write it down so that you can have a glance at them and have a picture that you want to take in your mind so that when the time comes, you can just help them out with those poses right there and then. So this is an easy one. Most of the time, if you're lucky and there's an MC, he has a short list of everyone who wants to take pictures in their family shot. Most of the time it's the parents of the bride and groom who will take the first pictures. Sometimes it is with the officiating ministers. They already have a list of all of that, but if they don't, then you end up coordinating that. Just go on Google, search for group pictures short list and you're going to get a bunch of them so that isn't really an issue for me a bigger or a larger family you would need to get a wider lens sometimes use the 35 mm f 1.8 sometimes you have to get like a 24 millimeter and sometimes even where you have them arranged you can't see everyone so the ideal thing i do is we have the kids in front so the kids will be in front we have the shortest <laughs> in front. We always go with that rule and it works for us. Some people will prefer to squat in front of the bride and groom, which is fine. If that works for them, I mean, just go ahead and take the shot. So uh, for group pictures, it's not really an issue. Uh, one more thing is you also have to change your aperture because if you are shooting at f1.8, some people on the or some people in the back or some people in the front are not going to be focused on. So most of the time for group pictures, I'm shooting at f4 to f5.6. If I have to increase my ISO or reduce the shutter speed, that is what I do. Make sure everyone there is in focus. This question is again quite similar, but again, I'm going to answer it. If you want to capture the personalities of the bride and groom, let them be in their natural state. Let them feel comfortable with themselves, how they act when they are generally together, or secretly together, when no one is around, how are they? Is the guy quite funny? Is the guy someone who makes the um, her, his woman laugh a lot? Let him be in his natural mood and you can get all those personality shots right in your videos. 
and pictures. Well, we are talking about photography. So write in your photos. Oh, this is an interesting one. So there has been an incident before where the client was expecting more than they actually requested for. Now, I'm not saying this in a bad way. They actually went for uh, the package which said soft copies only, but they were expecting me to do hard copies with my own money and all of that. And even during the actual wedding day, they were sort of stressing me out because they wanted to take pictures at certain places which we were not allowed to do. So it, it was quite hectic. And the funny part was even moving from one location to the other was quite stressful. But here's how I handled it. In a calm way, you just have to calm down. It is their day, so give all authority to them. But under one condition, as long as that authority is not undermining you in any way, you should give it to them. If you are comfortable with taking pictures at certain places that they requested for afterwards, it is fine. You can take pictures at those places. It is when you are done with all of them that they start requesting for the pictures. That is where your power also comes in. Yeah, you didn't request for drone shots, you didn't pay for drone shots, and you are now asking me for drone shots, which I took pictures of. But since you haven't paid for drone shots, you have to pay before I can deliver those pictures to you. Now, I know some photographers won't even bother setting up the drone to take it because they kind of didn't say it from day one. But for me, I would take the pictures, but I can't deliver to you until you pay. So again, in a situation where you have difficult clients, just calm down you would bear with me that those difficult clients are the ones who are paying the least amount on the package whatever package you have the high paying clients usually don't have so much stress to give you because they already trust in your art they trust in the work that you do and they know that you are going to deliver amazing results but the other ones who are giving you way 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 less that you are actually requesting for they want to give you so much stress so in a situation like this most of the time i'll have all the groomsmen on one side and all the bridesmaids on the other side then i'll take a couple of shots then i'll switch it up so i'll have a mixture of both of them so sometimes it's going to be one groom one bridesmaid and so on and so forth till we get to the last person now say this is the safe way of doing it because you can't really make mistakes with this one but in some situations where you want to get a little bit more creative you can add in chairs have them sitting on either side you can ask them to incorporate different styles everyone have their own flow and energy bring it to the party and you take those pictures from there now, one way I do this is make sure that I am always aware of my surrounding. So an example would be if someone is holding out their invitation card during the event, looking at it, I'm going to go over their shoulder, just stand there for a couple of seconds so that the moment they notice you, they get comfortable with you standing there. That is where I get my shots. Be prepared, basically be prepared. If the bride is walking down the aisle, you know definitely the groom is going to smile or laugh or cry seeing the bride in her wedding dress for the first time. So the moment you see the bride walking down the aisle, take a couple of shots, turn towards the groom and take your shots from there because something is definitely going to happen. If you can't do both of these yourself, get a second photographer. So you will be the one looking down the aisle, waiting for the bride, taking pictures of her. Then the second photographer will be taking pictures of the groom and people around, people with their smartphone, capturing people, laughing, people smiling, the parents of the bride and the groom and all of that. You have an awareness that something is going to happen. They are either going to laugh, they are either going to cheer, they are either going to take out their phone and take pictures. You are aware of all of these so you prepare yourself towards all of this and you get those natural candidates from there. The answer to this question is quite similar to what we just discussed. If you have been to a couple of weddings before, you know that there's a general routine that goes on. There are some weddings that totally you don't expect a lot of things, but there are some weddings you already know that this comes before this, this comes before that and so on. So the moment you see all of this, just prepare yourself for that. And this is going to help you capture those emotions. They are pronouncing them husband and wife for the first time. You know that the audience are going to cheer. So in a situation like this, 
you just take a couple of shots with the bride and groom, you turn your camera towards the audience, you take your pictures, you take as many pictures as you can. Some people are smiling onto your left, some are smiling on your right. <laughs> I interchange them. So just be prepared for all of these moments and you're going to get the emotion that you need. Now, this is quite simple. Just arrive on time. The moment I get there, the first thing I ask for is the accessories that the bride is going to use. So her earrings, her shoes, the bouquet of flowers, sometimes a bracelet, sometimes a head, what do you call it? The crown, I almost said head pan. <laughs> the crown, you have all of that in mind. You ask for those accessories. Sometimes it's just a bridal fan, sometimes it's just a dress, all of those amazing stuff. Just get all of them, take pictures of them whilst she's getting her makeup done. So arrive on time and you can get those shots as early as possible. Use whatever means you want to use, whether take them outside and get those shots using the leaf as a foreground, using it as a background, all of that. You can get all of those if you arrive early. For the decorations, most of the time you go for the reception when the bride and groom are taking their group shots after a church program or after the, yeah, I would say the white wedding, that is where you have to get to the decoration ground on time because most people will be moving towards that reception end. And the moment they start sitting down, filling up the place, you can't get your shot of the deco. So if, again, you have a second photographer, he can be taking the group shot, then you would move to where the decor or decoration is taking place, the reception, and take all of those pictures before everyone starts trooping in. So again, that is my approach of handling it. But if you don't have a second photographer, you make sure you get there on time. If it is possible, talk to the ushers that they should hold on on letting people in. You just need about five minutes. I think five minutes is even too much. If you have prepared and if you have a fair idea of what you want, five minutes is a lot of time. So probably two minutes, you stand here, you grab your shots, you stand at the center, you grab your white shots, you stand at one end, you get your shots of the glasses, the shots of where they will sit and all of that. If you have a fair idea of what you want, you typically don't need too much time. Now, the best way I manage time is to have a fair idea of what I want to shoot. So before the wedding day, I've already discussed with the client or the couple where they want to take their exclusive pictures. So sometimes, most of the time, uh, we take our exclusives at hotels. So hotels with some nice scenery, you already have a fair idea of how they look. If you don't look it up on Google map, you are definitely going to get people who have posted pictures of it. You are definitely going to get photographers who have shot at that locations before. So you can go on Instagram, type the location name in there and you're going to see a bunch of pictures. So you have a fair idea of what style of photography you want to do, where or which part of those particular areas you can take such pictures. Another thing for me is I have a short list of every picture that I want to take. Like I mentioned before, the first ones, they are just to get the bride and groom in the moment. So hugging each other, holding hands and all of that. Those are the typical shots that I do just for them to get comfortable around each other. But when it comes to actually taking the pictures, I have a short list. So sometimes I write them down. Sometimes they are pictures of other photographers that I have in a gallery on my phone. Sometimes they are saved posts on my Instagram, which I can refer to at any point in time. Now in doing so, because I already have an idea of what we are going to do, we just get there, we start taking those pictures and in no time we are done and we can move on to the next step. But if you don't have a fair idea, that is where the problem comes in. You'll be like, um, you know what, let, let's stand here. Uh, okay, the sun is too high. You know what, let, let's come here. Uh, okay, there's a bush here, so uh, the color is not, I mean, you seem a bit confused and it becomes a disadvantage to you and the client. So just have a short list of everything you want to do and it's going to help you manage your time effectively. One of the ways is always to be on the lookout for new ideas. So I'm always on Instagram or TikTok or other social media platforms looking for other styles, looking at other photographers style of shooting, picking ideas from how they shoot. So I look at other people's work and I incorporate that 
into my style. And truth be told, that is one of the ways I have been creative through my wedding photography journey. Now, this question, I believe, also is a bit answered in how to capture emotions. So again, I have the client feeling comfortable, letting them know that there's no one around. It's just them, just being comfortable around each other. And that is how I get those shots that I need. And however, their relationship with each other is they would want to portray it in those images. So if they are comfortable walking, holding hands, I mean, they are probably, or they probably worked in the rain together or one person has accompanied one person to the house before. So they are already aware of what they've been doing. So if they are comfortable walking along a particular shore, if they are comfortable walking along the streets or something like that, again, be prepared for anything. The moment you hear someone laughing or shouting or showing excitement, just turn your camera towards them and grab a couple of shots. You as a photographer is over there to provide your couple with beautiful memories, not memories of bad events. So again, don't add to their stress. And in doing so, they being in their natural mood, they being in their excited mood because it is their wedding day, no one is really sad on a wedding day you are going to get your excitement shots or you are going to get those shots of them being in their excited mood. But the bottom line is be prepared for anything. Anything can happen. Those memories can just kick in and through that you can get your amazing shots from there. This is an interesting question. So in terms of uh, people with different cultural backgrounds, what we do is first thing again, prepare. <laughs> just prepare because the culture of some people is not the same everywhere. We know we have so many cultures in Ghana. There have been instances where a typical engagement or a traditional wedding will last for like an hour, 30 minutes, sometimes two hours, maximum three hours we are done. But I went for one Ga traditional wedding and it took us five hours. So in a situation like this, you just have to prepare ahead of time. You ask the client, I mean, they basically know a lot about how the event is going to be. Well, not all the time. Don't quote me on that. They have a fair idea of how the event is going to be. Or even if they don't know, their family members have fair ideas of how it's going to be. So they can definitely contact the Ebusuya Pain or the people who are going to be talking on their behalf. Those people can educate them. Then they relay those information to you, the photographer. So once you are moving in, you have a fair understanding of how everything is going to be. There are some people, they see the bride before the groom comes in. Also at an event uh, in Takwa, before the groom comes in, the bride has to show herself to the family of the groom uh, four times. So on the fifth time, the fifth time is when she has her traditional wedding gown on. So the fifth time, the groom had already come in so on the fifth time that is where they see each other for the first time in their outfits like i said this was something that i didn't really know but again if for some reason you can't plan ahead of time try this trick there is no wedding without the bride so follow the bride everywhere she goes so if she's going to see the family if she tells you she's going to see the family follow her capture your video capture your pictures if she's going to see the husband do that wherever she's going make sure that you have a fair idea or you have your ears and eyes on the lookout for the bride there's no wedding without the bride so keep that in mind this is an important one go with a telephoto lens don't be shooting on the 35 millimeter or a 50 millimeter when you know that you are going to be blocking a lot of people's views. Even with the 85 millimeter, sometimes you see that the elderly people will be like, hey, photographer, the place you are standing is not going to be comfortable for me because you are blocking my view. I can't see these people. I, can't, I also want to take pictures with my phone and all of that. Go with a telephoto lens so that even if you are standing at a far enough distance, you can still zoom in and take your shot. If you are using the 70 to 200, you can be standing way back and still get your amazing shot. Don't be shooting on a wide lens when you know it's an intimate moment and you can't get too close. There was also one other incident back at Enzima. It was the traditional wedding. Why is it always the traditional wedding? 
it was a traditional wedding. We were almost done. It was time for our exclusives and it started raining. The bride wasn't ready to wait till the sun comes back up and take pictures because the white wedding was at a different place altogether. But my camera cannot be in the rain. So the maid of honor actually had the camera up. I was standing with her and I was taking the pictures. Once they were in the rain, I was taking the pictures under the umbrella. So in a situation like this, you just have to improvise. Like I said, keep calm, analyze your situation, know how you can handle it and just go for it. Now, in another situation where you can't even take pictures outdoor, I mean, if it's raining outside, you can go indoors, set up your off-camera flash, your modifiers and your light stand, set everything up, get your trigger ready and take all the pictures that you can indoors. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But in a situation where you still have to go outdoors, like I gave you my example, we still stood in the rain. If you can't do that, you can probably get um, a place where there's an overhead or what do you call it? <laughs> an overhead where the rain is not actually affecting the couple. So both of you are okay, even though you are outside, you have something covering your head or you have a building covering your head and you guys are okay. Now, sometimes the problem is not coming from the couple. It's coming from other members around the couple. So what do you do? You keep it in mind that it is the couple that you are working with and it is the couple that you are trying to satisfy and not any other person. So this is how I keep calm. With that mindset, I just take the pictures for the couple. Sometimes they would want to move you to, hey, I have a local bar here. Can you take pictures of it so that I can post on my page and advertise? Yes, I can do that. But until I'm done serving the couple, I can't come to your end. They are the ones who invited me to the place. They are the ones who booked me to cover their wedding. So until I'm done serving them, I can move towards your end. If it is a situation where the couple is actually the problem, what do you do then? Again, you know that they are the ones that you are serving. Now in a situation where someone else calls you to take pictures of them and you can't do that, and at the same time, you can't leave the client at any point in time. If you have a second photographer, you can have that second photographer go serve that particular person and just come back. So that is also another way to handle this situation. So in a situation where the space is much smaller or tighter than expected, I use a wide lens. So there are some hotels that um, the bride will be doing the makeup there, but unfortunately the rooms are small. So I switched to my 35 millimeter f1.8 lens just to get the wide shot over there. It is not ideal for me to use a 35 millimeter for portraits, but for wide shots, I can use that. Then if I just want a picture of their face or maybe from their waist up, even though it is a wide, um, a tight spot, I can use the 85 mil. If I can use the 85 mil, I switch to the 85 mil and I do that. Or you have them move further away from you, maybe towards a wall at the back or towards the window, right opposite on the other side. Or if you can just leave the room entirely, you do that. When it comes to a crowded space, like I mentioned, have your camera over the head of other people then you can take your shots from there. There are some situations you see photographers stacking up tables or a chair by standing on them so that they can have their shots from there. You can't really struggle so much by forcing your way through because people are dancing, people are jumping, people are jubilating and all of that. Someone may hit your camera, it may fall and break and that is going to ruin your day. So in a situation like that, if you can stay far back, get a zoom lens, get a telephoto lens, you can take your pictures from there. But like I said, if it is crowded, you can try that option. If it is in a tighter space, then go with a wide lens and take wider shots. So in most wedding photography, we focus more on the bride, which is fine. But if you want to capture the groom's perspective or the way I do it is most of the time I shoot over his shoulder or better still from behind him. So in that case, anything he's looking at, I also have it caught on my camera. 
So most of the time when the preparation is in the hotel, for example, once we are giving the go ahead to come in, we ask for the accessories, mostly from the planner, if there is one. And if there isn't, then I ask the maid of honor. I ask for who the maid of honor is, and she is the one who gets all of those items for me. Now, in a situation where the maid of honor is also not present, that is when I talk directly to the bride. Now, before all of this is happening, I have already introduced myself as the photographer. So just to announce my presence there so that once they see me with the camera taking pictures of them and all of that they already have a fair idea of who i am so they are not going to be too uncomfortable around me now most of the time the bride is very much aware of where most of her items are she either points me in the right direction or requests that one of her friends gets it for me now once i have the item i find a nice spot to start taking pictures of it whether indoor or outdoor just find an appropriate spot to get creative with those accessories now whilst all of this is going up i'll be setting up my light somewhere else since very soon i'll be taking a couple of shots of the bride herself sometimes with a friend or just with a dress and all of that so we pretty much set up ahead of time before she is done with her makeup then by the time she is done with it everything is ready to just start firing over and over again. Well, this is an interesting question. I would say the first thing is to keep calm. The moment you panic, you are going to make mistakes. So analyze the situation. So the moment you notice that there is something going wrong or there's an emergency or there are some unexpected situations, keep calm, analyze the situation and know how best you can handle it. Let me give you an example. There was one time that we were shooting at Takwa and if you are <laughs> or if you've lived in Takwa or are staying in Takwa you know there's this term Takwa at 2 which literally means that almost every 2 p.m at Takwa it rains we didn't really anticipate that it was going to rain because the sun was so scorchy during the day so once the program was still ongoing it started raining and some people were running away trying to cover their hair and all of that we have to take pictures the program is still ongoing you still have to make sure that you are covering the event so what do we do we just quickly grab an umbrella cover the cameras so the main camera had an umbrella i was using the gimbal so what i did was i grabbed my face towel and i covered the camera and the gimbal with the face towel it was big enough to cover the whole thing so in a situation like this Am I going to say, even though the program is still ongoing, I'm going to stay at one side or just leave because it is an unexpected situation? No, you have been booked to cover the event. So as long as the bride and groom are still there, you have to find solutions for yourself. So I'll talk about just three. One of them is having the bride with her ring on her finger on the chest of the groom. And they, and they being close to each other, eyeball to eyeball facing each other. The second one is, again, a hug from behind. Mostly it works well when it is the guy hugging the lady from behind. So the lady can be there and the gentleman will hug her from behind and tilt himself to one side so that I can see or capture his face and the bride's face at the same time. And the third one, as you guessed it, will be holding hands, walking towards or away from my camera. Now, I'll say some photographers would make this mistake. I have made a couple of them myself, so I know. Arriving at the wedding event late, that is the number one mistake you shouldn't do at all. Make sure you are on time. If it is starting at 9 a.m., you have to be there at least an hour before. So that is going to be at 8 a.m. Because the moment you get there, you have to take shots of um, the accessories. You have to take shots of day getting ready and all of that. So if you are there on time, there are so many things you can do in terms of photography. But you are, when you run late, they don't have time for you. They just want to rush to the event ground and get married. So this is not the time that, I mean, that will not be the time for you to set up your camera and all of that to take pictures. Arrive early and do all of those things before they move to the event ground. Another mistake would be going to the event ground or the uh, dressing room or dress up, all of that, unprepared. You go with a single camera, you go with a single SD card, you go with a single battery, you go with a single speed light, 
like everything is just single 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 you don't have any backup of it you don't get your light stand with you you don't have your trigger so you are always having the flash on top of your camera in situations where you have to probably take your pictures off camera how do you do that you can't do it because you didn't actually prepare for it so the actual or i would say the most important thing that you should avoid will be going to the wedding event unprepared and i say this because if you are prepared to do your job these are the mistakes you are going to get rid of immediately another mistake would be trying to be too professional i mean if someone is telling you to try this pose or try that effect or try this just listen to them if it is good enough and you take the shot it goes into your portfolio it goes into your credit you are the one who took that shot that person who told you that or gave you that idea i mean you may not even see that person ever again is that person going to comment on your video or your post that hey i gave you that style so pay me or something no be as professional as possible but again if you are listening to other people there's nothing wrong with that if they are giving you poses ideas <laughs> posing ideas and all of that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that if you can listen to them if it is good enough you take it if it's not good enough i mean you can take the pictures let them feel satisfied once they leave you can go ahead and delete it there's absolutely nothing wrong with that now i say the best way is to have enough light in your scene photography is all about light photo means light so photography graph of light basically you have enough light so that if the scene is too dark you can quickly expose for your couple using your lights bringing all of those artificial lights back in now moving away from light also make sure that your lenses are of premium quality you don't expect to use a kit lens and a prime lens at the same time so if you have prime lenses just go with all prime lenses you don't expect to be shooting at um, 18 millimeter or the kit lens which is 18 to 55 millimeter f 3.5 to 5.6 then you switch to maybe the 50 mil f 1.8 if you can stick with the 50 mil f 1.8 use it throughout don't switch between a good lens and a terrible one back and forth so if you want consistency make sure if you have a premium lens or you have a prime lens that you are shooting with you have a whole collection of prime lenses or a whole collection of premium lenses to use so for wedding photography we have what we call packages so depending on the package that the client goes for that is going to determine how i'm going to deliver their photos to them what i use is google drive so i have a folder for every program in the year so if it's year 2024 20, the month and the clients that are shot pictures of let me add that so usually i'll upload all of their pictures onto the google drive folder and i'll share the link with them so the moment they access that link they have all of their pictures in there some people also prefer sharing their images on whatsapp as whatsapp document which is fine i don't use that another thing is if the client also opted for frames after i have shared the google drive link with them they should go through or they would go through every picture has its own particular number so um, picture 14 picture 20 are not the same every picture has its specific number attached to it so if it is a photo book i ask them to select those numbers and share it with me if they can screenshot and share it with me that is also fine but the numbers work a lot easier so if they are supposed to select practically um, 100 pictures for their photo book they will write it on a piece of paper or type it out or anything of that sort and share it with me the same applies for frames if i'm supposed to do five frames for them they just share the number of the photo with me and i do or send those photos out there for the printing press to print out those images now for the last time i'm mentioning this on the premium service they can actually just select their images on the website and you also get the notification but like I said, I haven't upgraded to PC sets yet. So this is what I do at the moment. When it comes to copyrights, well, most of us know that the one who presses the shutter is the owner of the photos. But then again, the client booked you to take pictures of them for them. So 
in actual sense the copyright is shared among you two so the photographer has the freedom to post those pictures for advertisement or marketing purposes whilst the client also has the right to keep those pictures or photos for their personal use. It is when they start benefiting from those photos that it becomes a problem. So again, just have a contract, list all of your copyright issues in that particular contract. And if they agree with it, they can sign and that is where you get all of those information. Again, I should mention that my wedding photography contract is going to be available for download in the paid Becoming a Wedding Photographer course. So check the first link in the description below if you are interested in that. But like I said, ideally, as long as you are the photographer taking the pictures, editing them, you own the pictures. But in the situation where the client actually requests that you don't do it in this way, you don't do it in that way, and it is written and signed by both parties, that is where if you post them, then you have an issue because you sign that you are not going to post them and all of that. All of these depends on the clients that you are working with. In Ghana here, most of the time we don't usually use it because the mindset is that if the photographer takes a picture, he has every right to post it. If the client takes a picture, they have every right to post it. That is where the issue comes in with, sometimes a photographer will edit the picture to suit his style. The client will slap on a filter that is going to change the photo entirely. And even though the photographer's logo is on it, the client still decides to post it. Then it becomes an issue because it's like you are destroying the reputation of the photographer, dimming his style, but applying a filter on it. So all of these are just copyright issues that ideally we have in the contracts. We already talk about them before they are signed. Now, this is quite a controversial topic because most people feel that if you advertise on social media like Facebook and Instagram using the meta advertisement platform, you are going to be heard by so many people. Yes, it does work, but most of the time, the clients who are seeing you for the first time, because you haven't actually taken pictures of them, we have or they have this sort of issue with trusting your brand. What shows that the pictures are taken by you? What shows that you can do all of that? Those are some of the issues. So most of the time I rely on word of mouth. So if I take a picture or if I cover the wedding of one particular client, let's again, let's call them client A and they really love it. I try to get as much feedback from them. I try to let them review my photos. If they can give nice comments on my Instagram pages and all of that, that is a thumbs up for me. If you do an amazing job, they are most likely going to recommend you to their friends. And it is their friends who are also going to recommend you to their other friends. So you end up forming this circle around you and the circle becomes bigger and bigger and bigger because more people are recommending you. If you are relying solely on social media, it doesn't work so much. So for me, yes, I do rely on social media. Sometimes you have to advertise yourself, get new clients, get new ideas from people. But most of the time, I rely on word of mouth. Most of the time, I rely on friends that I already know and clients I've already worked with to share my expertise in the field. Now to talk about pricing, again, I'm going to say that if you want my pricing guide, it's going to be free for download in the wedding photography course, still linked below the first link in the description below. So be sure to check it out. But most of the time, I structure my prices based on the number of days that I work, not on the number of hours, based on the number of days. So a three-day event is going to cost more, obviously. A two-day event is also going to cost more than a one-day event. Even if it is a one-day event, is it just traditional wedding only? Is it both traditional wedding with um, a white wedding is it going to come with reception all of that you take into account before you actually put your price out there and i don't like the idea of telling the clients that i charge hundred dollars for this or i charge two hundred dollars for a wedding no you have to get a clear understanding of what they want to do every client's project is different no one wedding is the same you can testify for yourself the families are going to be different the clients are going to be different so just have a sit down with them just <laughs> no not a sit down it can be a phone call or 
through texting just have a fair idea of what they want and what they are expecting then through that you can generate a custom pricing guide for just them but yes i know some clients they just want to come into your dm and ask for your pricing guide what is your pricing guide and they are expecting you to send them a pdf or share your link to your website to show that this amount this amount this amount that is also fine you can do that but again make sure that they understand that every client's guide is different every client's budget is custom so they can see 7000 ghana cities there for the highest package but it doesn't mean it's going to be exactly 7000 if that's 7000 ghana cities budget doesn't go with a drone shot but they want a drone shot it will come at an extra cost so does it mean the photographer has to bear that cost no so again sit down i sit down with them <laughs> i keep saying sit down yes i just sit down with them discuss with them know exactly what they want then i price it according to what they want i would like to say from google but unfortunately you can't get a lot of information from google if you are not searching for what you actually want i would say instagram has been my go-to page i follow a lot of photographers from instagram and all of that youtube also in terms of um, technology the cam the new cameras out there um, the new style of shooting photos and all of that i also follow a couple of photographers on the platform and also camera reviewers on the platform so i'm always sort of updated on the latest technologies and trends in this industry now i go with the mindset that everyone out there is working for the client everyone is trying their possible best to make the wedding day as memorable in a good way for the client as possible so let them do i basically let them do what they do and let them do their work so if the makeup artist is trying to take videos of the bride for a page just allow them if the wedding planner wants to see you or talk to you about certain things listen to what they have to say if videographers are crossing you and it is becoming annoying let them be aware if they have to take their shots i mean you can be like hey i know you want to take this particular shot so let me get a couple more then you just leave him if he has about two minutes to spend with the client or the couple allow him to spend with the couple so you'll be surprised that if you allow him or her the videographer to um, work with certain poses you can even get some inspirations from what he or she is doing and you can also get a couple of shots from there if you are the photographer also you can get the vendors instagram pages so that when you post you can tag them in your photo when someone finds these images and they want to contact specific vendors they can look in the caption of your photo and get all of these people also in there now most of the time i just focus on what i am doing if someone walks up to me and be like can you take a picture of me with my smartphone i'll be like sure i can do that but you notice at this very moment the bride and groom are cutting their cake so you let me finish with taking that picture then i'll attend to you okay you have a nice way of saying it now note after saying this the moment you get your shot if there's nothing extraordinary going on make sure you walk up to that person and take the picture <laughs> for them don't forget and even if you forget and you remember later on find a nice way of saying it another way is our snapchatters and tiktokers they always want to be the first to post particular images and videos so they will be crossing you so what i do is usually i will be standing at a specific place so once they are coming closer to me i make them aware that they shouldn't be crossing my camera or my lens between me and the client there's no one there that is for most of the time but sometimes the music is too nice or too loud sometimes they go around the bride and the groom so you can't really get your shot so what i do is i basically carry my camera i lift it up over everyone's head and i take my shots so i'm not really distracted so much about how the scene or everything is going so far now i would say that is also an ideal way of getting different angles for your shots so there's absolutely nothing wrong with lifting your camera up to take certain pictures imagine having a drone you can also do something like that now most times even though they aren't really the focus in the shot i would have the bride's dress at the back usually just 
becoming more of a background. Sometimes I'll have her hold up her shoes. In some cases, she's going to hold up her bouquet. And in other cases, I'll let her play with the earring as if she's now fixing it on and all of that. All of those are examples of ways I incorporate these sort of accessories in the shoot. Now, it's not all the time that the focus is actually on what is in the focus. The other things which are also out of focus also constitute to providing a more pleasing look in a wedding photo. So an example of having her dress behind there, it is serving as a prop. So it is actually among the items in the background. If she even has two dresses ready and mounted on a dummy, then you can have both of them creating that sort of symmetry, one on the left and one on the right. It makes it a lot nicer. Now, if you've ever been to a wedding, you know that during the reception, everything is happening very quickly. Most of the time, that is when everyone is going to be jamming to some loud music. So in situations like this, I usually have a faster shutter speed and ISOs cranked high. I don't mind shooting at ISO 1000 or 1600 just to compensate for a faster shutter speed. This is where having a prime lens is also going to be an advantage because you can shoot at f1.8, 1.4, or even 1.2. It isn't very ideal. Usually for those fast moving subjects, I would like to shoot right around f2.5 and 2.8. And I feel that is going to help me get most of my shots in focus because I'm shooting very quickly. But shooting very quickly is not enough. You also have to get a flash or speed light that is able to keep up with the shutter speed. So in most cases, everyone will say don't shoot above 1 over 200 of shutter speed. But in some cases with high speed sync speed light, you would have to shoot maybe 1 over 250, 1 over 400, and even 1 over 500 just to get everything in your shots. And this is where continuous lighting also helps out. Because you are not using speed lights which are going to be flashing most of the time, the camera focuses before it goes off. If you have continuous lighting, since it is already lighting up your subjects, you know how it is going to look and you can capture all of those shots even without using a speed light. But then again, most portable continuous lights are not going to give you that much flash power or light as you may want. So your shutter speed may have to come down just a little bit. One of the ways is having a telephoto lens. So if you are not too much in a confined environment, telephoto lenses are going to give you much better results. Now, in case you don't know, lenses lesser than 70 millimeter distorts the human face. So any telephoto lens within the range of 70 and above should give you much better results. Usually from wedding, we want to say go for the 85 millimeter because that is the, I would say the cheaper option when it comes to portrait photography. You can also get the 100 millimeter macro lens because it is going to be more zoomed in, all the contours on the face of your bride are going to align perfectly. Another thing would be to shoot wide open. And whilst doing that, you introduce foreground and background in your shots. Now, even though your focus is on the bride, literally, you have to add in those sort of elements to make the focus still be on the bride. Everything else is going to be bled out making it a lot more nicer and pleasing to the eye. And also introduce light. You can set up an off-camera flash to one side and a continuous light to her back. That is going to be quite great. Sometimes you can set up a light at the back of the bride to light her up from behind. Sometimes you have to put that extra light to light her background just to make her pop more out of the background. Now, all of these won't work if the bride is not comfortable to give you those poses and smiley faces. So generally, just have a pleasing atmosphere all around your personality, making it a lot easier for her to be in a comfort zone to give you those amazing pictures. So three things, shoot with a telephoto lens, shoot wide open and introduce lights. You can try what most people aren't doing. Black and white photos for wedding events is not so common, especially in this part of our world. Most people like to shoot graded and moody pictures. They want the colors to pop as much as possible. So you can be like, uh, you can be that photographer who takes pictures with the saturated backgrounds. Now again, there isn't any right or wrong way of taking pictures. There's just the way. So hopefully I've been able to answer most of the questions you have with regards to wedding photography. Now, if you found this video helpful, I'm launching a whole series of online courses from how to become a YouTube product reviewer, 
learning about wedding photography and videography, graphic design, and all of that good stuff. Everything is going to be on the Phenomenal Concept website. That is phenoconcept.com. Phenom short for phenomenal. As always, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel and our other channels, which I have them linked below. And as always, don't forget to share with your family and friends. This is Theo from Phenom Concept. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one.